2006, 700000 plus dollars was a whole load of money for Floyd Mayweather to be betting on himself, but he did that by buying out his top rack contract. If it was up to Bob, Mayweather would have never fulfilled his potential. Bob had Mikey Garcia sitting on the sidelines, frustrated with his situation. Bob Arum and HBO literally killed Rigondeaux's career when they didn't get the result they wanted. Rigondeaux upset their plans and comprehensively outboxed Nanito Donaire. HBO took him off the main portion of the broadcast. Yeah, they did that. Bob was almost bragging to people that he's unpromotable if there's ever such a word what promoter does that i can't promote this guy and come out and say instead of he let the guy go let him seek out another option you come out and try and ruin his career there was also people like barry mcguigan this is why i can't stand barry mcguigan to add to the fact the way he used to duck a zoom and nelson barry mcguigan was doing everything he could to damage rigandale's reputation you was prepared to try and destroy Rigondeaux's career, coming out and saying, oh, he's boring, nobody wants to watch him fight, because you and Carl Frampton were so shook about facing him. But it was Bob, his promoter, who'd done the damage. Oscar De La Hoya, he earned a lot of money with Bob, let's not get that twisted, he did. But that wasn't really through Bob. Oscar got $400,000 on his debut. He was a huge star before Bob signed him. When he was an amateur, his mum was dying of cancer. Shelly Finkel paid all of his mother's hospital bills, expenses, paid for the funeral, shelled out over 100000 so Oscar could remain an amateur. And it wasn't until two years after where the Barcelona Olympics was the scene where Oscar won his gold medal. Oscar ended up not signing with Shelly Finkel and he got 400000 on his debut. So we can't really say he built Oscar. Oscar was... A hot property even before he won the Olympics. Even before he made his debut as a pro. And Oscar still ended up leaving him. Manny Pacquiao ended up leaving him. You see what's happening with Teofimo Lopez. He's trying to buy out his contract. The problem I have with Bob. Is when he can't get his own way. He tries to destroy the fighter. Before letting them go. He tries to destroy them. Bob wants to convince the world that. If you can't get big with Bob, you can't get big with anyone else. And there's already enough evidence and proof that that's a load of bull crap. He's just not that good a promoter. I could have bought some fancy house with the money I've been shelling out to promote Terence Crawford. Well, go buy your fucking house and let him out of his contract. This guy's earned a vast fortune of boxers. There's always a risk of losing capital when you're in the business of boxing promotions. Always. But you don't come out in public, express to the public, well, I'm scared to lose money. I'm, you don't do that. Who does that? Bob Arum does that. What Bob has been doing is actually bad for boxing. Because some of our best talents, he's tried to stifle them out. He's tried to undersell them to the public in case they leave and be fruitful elsewhere. At least Frank Warren just took them to court. He didn't really slag them off like that. In public. Now Frank has said some messed up stuff about the boxers he used to promote. But he's nowhere near as nasty and spiteful as Bob Arum. Nowhere near. I would actually argue Bob is bad for boxing. Yeah, I would. So Eddie Hearn is exploring a Huey Fury, David Price fight. Interesting. It's a fight I think David Price will be up for. Minus the inactivity. He hasn't fought for a while, has he? And Huey fought last year against Marius Wack. But if the Marius Wack fight is an indicator that this is Huey's new style, he leaves himself wide open with that more reckless approach against Price's more snappier shots, a lot more accurate than Marius Wack. A better puncher, has better hand skills, and his power could give Huey quite a lot of problems. Huey's lack of a concussive punch as well is something that could entice David Price into a fight like that. Seen as Big Dave doesn't take the best punch. Huey, on the other hand, does have a good set of whiskers. Takes a good whack. And he'll need a good chin if he gets hit flush by David Price. No doubt. Huey's stamina is superior to David Price's. And if he can get him into the late rounds. But 
in saying that, it's not just getting pricey into the late rounds. You're going to have to put the work in. You're going to have to sap the strength out of Price's legs because it's not just getting Price into the late rounds. It's putting him under pressure, making him fight consistently through the three-minute duration per round. I like the fight, though. I like the fight. Huey's younger than Pricey, so he might have the legs to stay out of range early and box out the decision, but this is just my opinion. Huey, even coming forward against Marius Wack, he's very messy. And when he boxes on the back foot, same thing. It's very scruffy-looking boxing. I think Price is a better boxer. I'd be interested if that fight is made, though. I'm just saying that. It's Price's power and tidier boxing skills against Huey's better chin and stamina. I don't know what Eddie's going to do with the Parker and Chisora fight because I'm not going to pay pay-per-view for it. I can't remember the last time Joseph Parker has put in a pay-per-view performance, or if he ever has, actually, to be honest with you. I'm not going to pay for Chisora just coming off a loss against Yusek, even though it was a close loss. No, I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not going to pay for it. Eddie's also talking about putting Savannah Marshall and Clarissa Shields matching them together. It's a decent fight. I know Clarissa fought yesterday, but I've just got no interest in it. It went the distance, and they're saying she won undisputed and whatnot. But uh, I can't get into Clarissa Shields' fights unless she fights someone really good. If she's going to say she's the GOAT, then from what I'm seeing, she's got to take on Savannah Marshall. Because I believe the weight classes that she's been fighting in, apart from maybe a couple of opponents, the gene pools are weak. But I think Savannah's going to make a defense first of the belt she won from Hannah Rankin. So we're talking a little way down the line before Shields and Marshall. Still a little way off. I mean, Savannah beat her in the amateurs. Clarissa should want payback, surely. If she's the GOAT, you'd want to clean her up. Can't think of too many Showtime boxing events where a woman has headlined the event, a pay-per-view event. So when them numbers come in, according to Michael Benson or Mike Coppinger... It's going to be interesting because, you know, that's going to tell her what her market worth is. I was going to say we, but no, it's they. They, meaning the powers to be, may have to set her threshold lower to define what success is. You know, when I say the powers to be, I'm talking about the people at Showtime. So maybe 60000 is a success for her. And anything less than that, then, I don't know, I'm just throwing a figure out there. We'll see what's deemed to be a success and what is deemed not to be. But this ain't the music industry in the 90s when if you hung around labels, they'd have terms like artist development. I mean, this ain't that. You know, her gauge on what will be a successful pay-per-view will have to be weighed against what some of the women at the UFC are doing from Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunes, or whatever other females have been posting good numbers up on the UFC. Unless Showtime are looking for a long-term payoff that they're going to develop women's boxing on the platform, they're going to want big numbers. I saw some of the rounds. I couldn't really get into it. I watched the latter half of the bout. She dominated it, and she's the first woman to be undisputed in two weight classes, welter and light middle. But the vibes I'm getting is that it's got a lukewarm response. She did call out Savannah Marshall. But she's pricing herself out. She's telling Eddie Hearn to come up with 500 to 750k to watch her smoke his girl Savannah Marshall. Lou DiBella talking about, oh, we're not going over there because there's a good chance we could lose on the scorecards with Amanda Serrano, who turned down what I think was a career highest payday to fight over here against Katie Taylor. Same with Clarissa Shields. What is it you think the UK has over here? The streets are not paved with gold. When British fighters have to go across the pond, you don't hear them talking about, oh, well, I could get robbed on the scorecards. We've had to go over there because the infrastructure and world title opportunities traditionally has been in America. Well, if you're a female boxer, the infrastructure is in Britain. Why are you going to get all these concessions? You come over here and fight or don't fight. It's as simple as that. Now, if Eddie can crunch up the figures and give Clarissa Shields three quarters of a million pounds or dollars or whatever she wants it in fair enough i got no arguments with that if you can get it but it sounds like she's pricing herself out why do a lot of these americans think they should get x amount x amount because they're traveling over here to fight why is that exactly especially if they're not paying you that in america 
People say what you want about Eddie Hearn, but it's been in his window where British boxers are able to stay in the UK and American boxers are the ones having trouble with the role reversal that they have to come over here for potential opportunities. And it doesn't sit well with them. They don't like the idea of it. They hate it. You can hear it by the way they talk. Lou DiBella, by the way he talks. Amanda Serrano, Clarissa Shields, 750,000. Eddie Hearn, he's also talking about his relationship with Eddie Reynoso. And, you know, looks like Eddie wants to tap into that Mexican market. He's saying he could make the likes of Julio Cesar Martin as a potential star. And he likes the Mexican market. There's a lot of uncovered jewels out there. And you can see he enjoys being around that setup with Canelo and Reynoso. He loves it. And the fighters are very receptive to him. They're not, oh, you're low balling us, Eddie, and talking all types of street talk to him, not being business like. They're very receptive. They want to fight on Matram and zone. Even the youngsters around the setup are very mature, head screwed on. They want to get on. It's a good market. If they're getting paid and they're getting opportunities, they're going to take them. And that could be a very overlooked territory that might surprise a few people in terms of how popular it can be. Worldwide is the Mexican market. Now, we're obviously going to be talking about flyweights and bantam weights, featherweights, lightweights for the most part. That's where they're strongest. But nevertheless, there's some really good fights to be made and some really good fighters out there. So there's rumours that it could be a little bit of dissension in the Joe Gallagher gym. There's rumours that Callum could be looking at other options. And in Joe Gallagher's words, Liam Smith often goes over to America and he informs Joe that he's going to be working with Freddie for a few weeks and then they come back and they pick it back up. It's not a problem. But this time around, Liam is working with Manny Robles and he hasn't let Joe know anything about his plans, that he was going over there, how long is he staying over there, is he coming back? And Joe seemed a bit disappointed the way that Liam went about it. So we don't know where that is at the moment. And it looks like the Mexican style is having a big impact on the game with Eddie Reynoso, with the results he's getting with Oscar Valdez, Canelo and elsewhere. If this carries on, people are going to stop saying, oh, you need an American coach. They're going to be saying, you need a Mexican coach. Okay, so we had the three big promoters on there. Bob Arum, he was on the documentary and he said how Daniel Kinahan was honourable, smart, singing his praises. He said he's not concerned about his past, paraphrasing. As long as their business dealings are productive, it's a wrap as far as Bob is concerned. Eddie Hearn, they described him as the most powerful man in British boxing and that he's been working with the Kinahans for years. They um, got a transcript, not from Eddie directly, where Eddie's talking about, yeah, Kinahan is the guy behind Tyson Fury. Everybody knows this. And Eddie also said when his fighters tell him to go handle this business with that person, that person there, that's who Eddie goes to. It's not really up to the promoters to do background checks on who the boxer brings in as management. They spoke about Frank Warren being the second most powerful man in British boxing. Maybe that's what he's suing them about. <laughs> hey, I'm the most powerful. How dare you? No, but Frank, they had a picture of Frank, somebody in between and Daniel Kinahan. And Frank was saying he was a man of honor and that he didn't know anything about the allegations about the guy. They spoke about Frank Warren having a business dinner with Kinahan. And Frank's took umbrage to the whole thing and he's suing now, he hasn't sued a boxer in years, Frank Warren, but that doesn't mean he's softened up. <laughs> you got Frank, Eddie, and Bob. They've all been accused of the same thing, but Frank's the only one who's suing. <laughs> red flag, red flag, red flag, Floyd Mayweather. The other day, Floyd was bitching about there's too much belts. And we need to clean up some of these regular titles and baby belts. But that seems that all Tank Davis is fighting for. I mean, he's got the baby belt at 135. And now he's fighting for the baby belt, the second tier belt, not the third tier belt, at 140 against Mario Barrios. 
Practice what you preach, Floyd. Practice what you preach. Now, I'm going to have to play this one by ear because I'm not really understanding the fight. I watch Barrios and he's a very big light welterweight. Seems to hit hard, but I believe it's more volume than power. Doesn't move his head. Throws a good body shot. A lot of attrition. Now, it's either they know this kid can't box, so he's going to overextend, even though he's got the longer reach and he's taller, and get ate up by Tank's hooks and uppercuts. Or they're sick and tired of Tank and the yo-yo darting and... Perhaps he can't even make 135 right now and they're just throwing him in against someone with a belt, albeit at 140. Because if Tank looks good in this, you're going to have to call it clever matchmaking. It might not be against the so-called new age of the 135 pounders, Haney, Garcia, Lopez, Loma, etc, etc. It might not be against one of them, but Barrios with the Mexican... Heritage coming from San Antonio. His penchant for wanting to mix it up. His style of fighting, his size. His relatively impressive KO percentage. Relatively. If they pull it off, it's going to look pretty good. It's going to look pretty good. So I can't start slagging it off right now. I will say this though. like If you can't hold it together at one weight class for two to three years and develop a little resume. That's serious red flags. But I'm not sure how much five foot five or whatever tank is, how much more weight class is, is he going to prematurely abandon before he's built any resume there? And up to 147? Not sure about that. But if he wins, he's in line to fight Josh Taylor. He'll be the mandatory for Josh Taylor's WBA strap. I'm just curious to see what path tank and his boxing career are going right now. I'm very curious. It looks like a leverage move. They might go back to 135 if they're successful and say, well, Lopez ain't beat no 140 pound champions, baby belt or not. Neither is Haney, neither is Lomachenko. But in all fairness to Loma, he's a free weight champion. We can't expect him to indefinitely just keep moving up weight classes, moving up weight classes. There does come a point where there's a limit. Ryan Garcia, he just won to eliminate. He's not even taking his title shot at 135 in his first weight class. Now everybody knows I have been very critical of the PBC. Yes, I have. But I'm very much of the keep that energy. Keep that energy. A lot of people online are saying Tank is going to lose to Barrios. Yes, I've seen it. Mikey Garcia, he said Barrios can win this. And he's getting all excited while he was training. So keep that same energy. If Tank wins and wins well, let's not try and flip it back and say he was fighting some bum. Let's not do that. Devin Haney has a career defining fight coming up. We have a reliable and let's not forget quality trial horse in Jorge Linares challenging Devin for his 135 pound WBC strap. It's a very good fight for Devin. The type of fight that Ryan Garcia didn't want no part of. Linares is 47 and 5, 29 knockouts, 35 years of age, and he's a three weight champion from featherweight to junior lightweight to full lightweight. Linares was slated to face Javier Fortuna August last year, and he caught COVID and was hospitalized for a couple of weeks in Tokyo where he was training. Eric Gomez from Golden Boy, who promote Linares, say there are no lingering issues, and he's ready to go. Hey, how much I paying for that fight? Next to nothing, call my design subscription, because he's dirt cheap right now. This is an excellent fight for me. Excellent fight. You can't critique Devin for the opponent. He's the best available for Devin right now. The Lomachenko fight, with it being a cross-promotion, it would be nice, but, you know, politics as usual. Can't really write the upset off in this one because we haven't seen Devin in too many scenarios at Jorge Hinares' level. This is easily his best opponent. Gamboa, his best days were at Feather. Devin, he needs to win. And if he can look good doing it, he can strut around the 135 weight class with his chest out. You know what I mean? Good fight for him. As Eric Gomez points out, this is probably the last chance that Linares will have to fight for a world title. 
And Eric Gomez says, Linares has to go into the fight thinking like that. And he's correct. I didn't really think about it from that perspective. And he's correct. Devin has to be on point this fight. It's a dangerous fight. What can I say about Tony Yoko? He's got the skills to give most heavies all the problems they need. He has a good jab. He's got good size. He's quick. Doesn't have tremendous power, but he has power. I think the only thing right now I need to see is what happens when one of the premier punches in the weight class cracks him on the chin. Will he do another Erislandi Savon like he did in the amateurs? Or will he hold the shot? I think I've already sussed something out about Tony Yoka. Most people are not going to get excited about what they're seeing right now. And that's where his window of danger is. He's very efficient. Some people, some people overlook efficiency. Some people overlook it. And Yoka is not getting out a third for a lot of these fights. Now, making these observations, I still need to see more because his opponent was just a tall cruiserweight who I never heard of. Now, I still need to see more to see whether that my assessment that Tony Yoka is either one-paced or he hasn't had no need to show us them extra gears yet. Which one is it? His opponent, Jayco, on Friday, he done well to stay in there until the 12th, caught that jab to the face and then turned away from the action and quit. Yoka is 28 years of age. He won the Olympics in 2016. I think he needs a career-defining fight now. I don't think it's no point putting him in with trial horses. I don't think it's no point. I'd like to see a considerable name, a step up in his next fight. That's what I'd like to see. I just caught wind of the weigh-in and Jayco slapped Yoker in his face. And I was wondering why he didn't cruise more in the 12th round and just let the minutes run out, win by UD and not take no unnecessary chances in the last round. But it's obvious after seeing the weigh-in, he wanted payback. He wanted to punish him. He wanted to get him out of there. And he did it. He did it in the 12th. Yoko turned pro in 2017. He's 10-0. It would probably be about 12-0 if it wasn't for the doping violation and the suspension. I see potential there. But I see a heavyweight who's not setting the world heavyweight scene alight right now. France not really being a hotbed for boxing. Are his promoters going to be willing to pay out? Top dollar to get the top names in to build his resume. Is he prepared to travel? All of his fights have been in France. What's next?